Christian calling it in from Wisconsin. Hey. Christian, what's going on? Hello, I'm Christian. Well. How are you both? There we go. We're doing all right. Uh, I see that you wanted to ask a question about phylogeny to Aaron, which, I mean, that's right up Aaron's alley, I think. So go ahead. Yeah, I, I just had a, a quick question. I, I'm studying biology, and I wanted to ask you, oftentimes when I discuss with creationists, and I come from a, a very fundamentalist background in a fundamentalist creationist home, and I'm curious, often a lot of fundamentalists will ask me this question, can you explain to me how to trace back the human genus to the very beginning and just take me through step by step by step? Otherwise, I'm going to accept the God hypothesis. So how would you explain this in a way to where it's palatable and understandable to creationists? but also being respectable to the actual scientific literature. Uh, I did a, a video series that uh, is on 49 episodes. There will be a 50th episode coming out as soon as I can get the time to do it. Uh, but there, it's called the systematic classification of life. And I show from the most, the, the basest, or the most basal and the largest categories of what people are. Uh, because you never, you, you, contrary to a lot of creationist arguments, you never have an instance where one thing turned into or gave birth to another fundamentally different thing. That That's the thing that creationists always ask for, and they ask for that because it actually violates two of the laws of evolution. So it, it, it wouldn't even, it, it would actually disprove evolution, which is why creationists ask for that thing. In the, in the largest categories, let me give you an idea. I mean, uh, for... The Linnaean construct, you know, he had like seven categories, and we've discovered that there's closer to 70 named clades, and that's just the named ones. We've got a lot more that, that uh, don't have names that are classifications for people. I mean, mammal, for example. You know, at, at what point did a mammal ever give birth to a non-mammal? Well, we've given, you know, they've, they've produced populations of different types of mammals, but they never stopped being mammals. And one of the confusions that people have is it, well, it, I don't want to get into the, the confusion things, but you know, some, some people are using a, a 200 year old classification of reptile that nobody uses anymore. So that's one of the things that people get uh, confused about. But in that, that, that series, Systematic Classification of Life, I go every episode to describe what the criteria is for this clade. Do you accept that these criteria apply to you, that you fit this, right? So like a mammal didn't stop being a vertebrate when it became a mammal, it's still a vertebrate, right? Every mammal is still a vertebrate. And, and when you know, primates didn't stop being mammals. So there's no point when you stop being what you were to, to become the new thing. You may create a new clade that your parents don't belong to, but you still belong to every clade that your ancestors did. You can't grow out of your ancestry. I don't know if that answered your question. Did it? Oh, yeah. I that was, yeah, it, it got it got very much close. Can I ask a quick a quick follow up? I just I just I wanted to kind of dig in a little bit on on the aspects of of genus because I was <laughs> and one of the am I, can I am I good to keep going? Yeah, go ahead, Christian. Aaron's dogs oh, were just okay, really no excited. They wanted to they wanted to chime in too. So, oh, okay. I, I'm sure they know a lot about phylogeny, but. Yeah. <laughs> Regardless of that, I'm curious when you're when you're discussing the issues of, and you hear someone say, "Well, I'm not going to accept the the evolution, uh, the evolution evidence unless you can explain it to me 100 percent all the way through, or otherwise I'm going to just reject it offhand." How would you respond, I guess, to the more general points of that? So you have they have a belief system in which they have zero percent evidence, but they're not going to accept the evolution evidence unless we give them 100% evidence. It doesn't matter that no, nothing is ever 100% in any investigation, which is why things we know to be pr true and can prove to be true are still considered theories. So like atomic theory, is it just a theory that atoms make up everything? I mean, uh, is, is it just a theory that, you know, that, that uh, like cell theory of, of uh, biology or germ theory of disease? We know that germs, you know, pathogens cause disease. This is a fact, but we also put it into the classification of theory. A theory is a body of knowledge that has predictive ability and includes all of the facts, hypotheses, and even the natural laws, because there are some laws that are specific only to some theories, but they want to misrepresent that. So they want to, they want theory to sound like a blind guess where they have absolute conviction 
in the thing for which there is absolutely no evidence and, and literally no reason to believe it. So they're using a form of confirmation bias. They're putting unrealistic restraints and they should understand that the, the best you can get is what, 98% verification on anything. But and come on, understand. Oh, but Aaron, Aaron, you know, the Bible tells me, dude, like it's in there. That's the evidence. Come on, man. It's right there in Genesis. That's well, then you can't, you can't use the Bible to contest the Bhagavad Gita because the Bhagavad Gita says exactly the same thing. Yeah, yeah. But attributes, to, attributes it to a much stronger God and did, shut up, to a much stronger God and did that at, at minimum, minimum centuries, if not millennium before the Bible. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It, the way I always think of it, too, is like, like the Bible, specifically Christianity, is just one claim about how the world works. And there's a whole bunch of different claims. So we just have to figure out which claim is the most likely to be true, right? How do we determine one claim from another? I don't think people all really think about it that way. I think they just think like Christianity is the truth. And then there's like all these other ideas. You know, if you're used to thinking about it like that, it's going to be hard to kind of, you know, a lot of time. A lot of times these people think that the Bible is the oldest book. They have no idea. Yeah. Tell me that, that Christianity is the oldest religion. Really? It's older than Judaism even? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> but there yeah. are Christians who believe that. Yeah, yeah it's true. And, and, and they don't even realize, like, you know, that not only is it not the oldest, but it's not even the oldest surviving religion out there either. You know, ask any Zoroastrian and they'll be the first to tell you, you know, they've been doing it for even longer. So yeah, I, I, Hinduism is the oldest religion in continuous practice. But when people yeah. say that the, the Bible is evidence of God, well, then that means that the, the, that the, the Avestas of Zarathustra are therefore evidence of Ahura Mazda. Yeah. And the Bhagavad Gita is evidence of Lord Krishna. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't really work. They're not going to tell you that, yes, there is evidence of Lord Krishna. But yeah. they, they can't figure out what the disconnect. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you there. Christian, great call. Quick question. I loved it. Hopefully, uh, Arn was able to answer it for you. Thanks again for calling into the show.